Now it is time for the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Lawrence. Good evening, Rachel. And you actually make it look like it was the easiest thing in the world to sit down with you for an hour. I think a lot of people would want to do it, and I'm sure uh, Liz Cheney is, is very glad she got the chance to do that. Uh, that point she just made about not the lesser of two evils is such an important point to double underline from everything she's written in her book, everything we learned from the January 6th committee. Uh, I know plenty of times over the years I've heard people refer to their vote, vote choice as the lesser of two evils. Uh, that's not where we are anymore. No. And, and I think, Lawrence, one of the things that I didn't expect before um, reading the book um, and I probably should have when I started to see Republican reaction to it, is that a lot of the Republican issue with Liz Cheney is that she is not shy about saying what people are doing wrong. And she does not try to make people feel better about it when they are doing something wrong. She mm -hmm. does not go out of her way to say, oh, I understand you had a hard childhood or whatever. This is like meeting some emotional need of yours. You're doing the wrong thing at a time when your country needs you to do the right thing, and I'm going to call you wrong for doing it. And that is the sort of thing that... I mean, you have to be built a certain way to do that. But it also means that you've got a certain courage of your convictions in terms of how seriously people are screwing up and how much we need to course correct. And I, I find it now amusing to see all these Republicans, all these tough guy Republicans, um, talking about how much she hurts their feelings. But she's unafraid to do it, and it's worth doing it um, because of the, the stakes that she defines so clearly. I just... It's a remarkable thing. And, and, you know, Rachel, it's the way, uh, you know, in my personal estimate uh, in the 1990s when I was working in the Senate, it's the way about 80 percent of them were at that time. You know, when we would close the door and have, say, the Democratic senators of policy luncheon and you have almost, say, 50, we had 57 Democrats at the time. They don't all show up, but almost all of them do. There were some almost healthy, I would say, fistfights break out in that room in terms of just arguing across the table with each other in extremely direct ways. Mm. And then that would all kind of calm down into something else. And it would be all a way of getting to a consensus. But people did not uh, pull punches back. They weren't careful about your feelings when they disagreed with you on the tax bill. They just said, this is where I am. And they were very clear about it. I mean, Liz Cheney reminds me so much of the way both Democrats and Republicans handled themselves in Congress in the past. Yeah. And it's also like I, I saw yesterday, I think it was on CNN, Lindsey Graham responding to the claims in her book about the dangerousness of, uh, dangerousness of a potential second Trump term. And his take on it was like, oh, yes, I'm sure Liz has a lot of feelings about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. And he's just like, actually, dude, no, I, I don't I don't know if she has any feelings. I know that she doesn't think they're relevant to whether or not we have a democracy anymore. And so like trying to put things on her as if she's like, you know, a, a, a kid or a little girl or a sad little woman who needs mm -hmm. to be placated about her feelings in this just profoundly misunderstands her force um, in politics and what she's trying to do here and like really just gives lie to that kind of um, laziness which you know, the, in a way the, that I'm glad for. Yeah, I mean, uh, talk about feelings. I mean, uh, Lindsey Graham is just a ball of feelings uh, about Donald Trump and the feeling is fear. It's nothing but fear of Donald Trump and Trump voters in South Carolina. That's the way he lives his life in, in fear of those people. Uh, you know, there's one way in which Liz Cheney is extraordinary tonight and remains extraordinary even if we go back retroactively. And that is uh, the number of politicians that I'm aware of where I could watch them make the decision to do something, choose something that would not just hurt their reelection, but pretty much doom their reelection. Um, it's Mario Cuomo refusing to change his position on the death penalty in the 1990s. And sorry, I can't think of anyone since then uh, except Liz Cheney. And so for me, when I was working in, in government, the trick question for politicians always was, what would you not do to get reelected? And most of them would go blank. They wouldn't be able to follow the sequence of those words. They wouldn't quite understand what you just asked. The concept of something you would not do, you know, to get reelected. Uh, so Liz Cheney really just on that basis alone of being willing to do something uh, that she knew would pretty much prevent her from getting reelected. Uh, and she didn't just 
choose to do anything. She choose, chose to do the single most important thing that you yeah. could ask her to do. And, you know, people, in, when it's hypothetical, everybody's a hero, right? Everybody thinks they do the principled thing. We all look mm -hmm. at ourselves in history and think, oh, I'd be the resistance fighter, right? But in reality, the reason is, the, the, the reason there's so few of those people and the reason there are so few heroes is because in reality, when it, you know, when, when, when heroism comes up and knocks on your door, it's usually easier to pretend you're asleep. It's usually easier to let things happen and hope somebody else is going to take the rap. And here's somebody who saw it clear-eyed and did it knowing exactly what it would mean. And, and uh, Rachel, before you go, as long as we're talking about our Liz Cheney histories and, uh, <laughs> and our, our encounters, uh, I know the last time I was on television uh, with Liz Cheney, which was long before this program, uh, the subject was torture. One of mm. us was in favor. One of us was against. I, I, I have to check the the, uh, the record to see which one. Yeah. Uh, it might be why she's not coming on this program. But uh, <laughs> but it, it's it, it it's so uh, it makes so much sense to me to see the two of you there uh, tonight because this is the way. Again, it used to work in Congress where you could be adamantly opposed. You could be fighting Liz Cheney all day on, uh, you know, on tax legislation, and then you could be teamed up with her on something else. Mm -hmm. And that, that I used to see that all the time. You know, your fiercest opponent today, next week is going to be your most important ally in something. And so uh, I'm so glad to have seen uh, this interview tonight. This is, this is really, uh, this was worth waiting for. Thanks, Lawrence. I appreciate it, my friend. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you. Jen, I so, so eager to talk to you about this because this is one of those moments, I think, for insiders. Uh, you, mm. you, you've, you've been in this kind of, uh, you've been in government the way Liz Cheney has. She's worked in administration. And you be have. Yeah, yes. yeah. Before, uh, you know, she went to Congress, she worked in the administration grew up in it, in a sense, with her father. And to mm -hmm. see someone who stays anchored all the way through all of that experience so that when it comes down to it, and it comes down to a choice of her oath of office versus her re-election campaign, she chooses her oath of office. That's right, Lawrence. And, and I think as Rachel started that interview, which was so fascinating to watch, acknowledging it's a little weird to see our friend Rachel Maddow interviewing the daughter of Dick Cheney, right? But here we are because she stood up for democracy and wasn't shy about telling the truth. There's so many things. I haven't read the book yet because the book comes out tomorrow and I'm very eager to do that. But one of the things that was in the excerpts that stuck out to me and is a reminder of that is the scene of Dick Cheney going to the Capitol floor, the floor of the Capitol a year after January 6th to commemorate that day and being shocked there weren't other Republicans there and having an embrace with Nancy Pelosi of all people. Um, and that just tells you a lot about Liz Cheney, about what she's been willing to do. In a, in, that's very difficult. Um, really, she was third in line for the in the Republican caucus. And what she did meant she was, of course, no longer in leadership, no longer in Congress. Um, but I really I, I loved so many aspects of that interview. One of them, just to go down the nerdy government rabbit hole with you, Please here, do. because this is Please a safe do. place to do that I think we'll be talking about a lot more in the next couple of days is what she mentioned about the transition of power the peaceful transition of power. And it's so important to remember at a time when there's so much craziness that Donald Trump is saying and doing that there are normal transitions of power. There's normal disagreements, even strong visceral ones, as you were just talking about with Rachel. I was a part, I came in with Barack Obama when the Bush administration was leaving. Lots of strong disagreements there about many policy issues, including the Iraq war. It was a peaceful transition. It was a graceful transition. It was a they welcomed us with open arms and wanted to prepare us to govern the country. That is how it is supposed to work. And, and I thought it was interesting she mentioned that. I also my ears perked up because pardon power, I think, is something that is basically all powerful, as you know, well, Lawrence, that a president has that historically for the most part, and their exceptions, has not been abused. That power in the hands of a second term for Donald Trump is almost one of the scariest things. And the fact that she mentioned that, it's just a reminder of how important it is for us to pay attention to that.
Let's listen to uh, the part of the interview uh, toward the beginning when Liz Cheney was describing a few days before January 6th, when she started to get the feeling about what was coming. Mm -hmm. Let's listen to this. I had been getting these hints, you know, through the months after the election of sort of glimpses into things that um, that they were attempting to do. And each time sort of I, I saw something come up and I kept thinking, and I think a lot of us kept thinking, all right, look, you know, he's going to bring these court challenges. But of course, once the courts have ruled, he will concede and we'll move on. And, and each time you thought we were at an end, we weren't really at an end. And so I think this this was probably the most chilling moment where it was suddenly real that, you know, this wasn't just some sort of a, a PR effort to suggest that he hadn't lost the election. There was a very real plan um, to stop us from counting legitimate electoral votes. And, and and frankly, that realization, that recognition, it was nauseating because it was it was so scary. Wait a minute. Th this is what they're going to try to do. Mm. Jen, uh, it, it's such a, a vivid moment. It, it's just mm -hmm. such a, a sickening idea that she's listening in on a phone call about about this yeah. s strategy and, and hearing it for the first time. That's right. And, and thinking, which is so striking, this can't possibly happen, really. I mean, that's what I heard in her answer. Mm -hmm. You know, there's going to be some shenanigans. We know he's arguing the election was rigged. But this can't possibly happen. And, and listening to her uh, really brought me back to that day and the day before I was working on the presidential transition. And we thought, and we obviously didn't have as much insight as her, of course, but we thought there would be some shenanigans on the floor, some delay tactics, right? But never factored in, of course, what happened on January 6th. And it's all a reminder, listening to Liz Cheney talk and even just listening to Donald Trump talk, especially over the last couple of weeks, he is telling us exactly what he is going to do. So we should listen to him, right? And w though we think it's not possible, the system will protect us from it, the system is not equipped always for Donald Trump. And when he's telling us things like he's not going to listen to the judicial system or process, as she just reiterated in that interview, we need to listen to him. Yeah, let, let's listen to Liz Cheney's description, hypothetical description of how it would work, uh, how Donald Trump is basically promising uh, to run uh, things mm -hmm. if he's in the presidency again. Let's listen to that. Imagine a situation where, you know, the, the, the people around him, the lawyers that he's hired in the administration, you may have some who would, you know, imagine, you could imagine them stepping up and saying, wait, we can't take that action. We can't do that um, for legal reasons. And, and the president combining both his determination to ignore the rulings of the courts with offering pardons to people, you know, who do his bidding. And it is a it's a really toxic and, and very dangerous mix. And I think that people need to take seriously the potential that he will do that because, in fact, we're watching him and listening to him say he will do it now. And, Jen, if that message is going to get through to Republican voters, it seems that it has to come from a Republican voice. Yes, I think that's true. And I also think it's important for people in this moment to understand. She referenced pardon power. I know I referenced this earlier. Technically, any president has the power to pardon anyone they want. Historically, through the administrations I worked in and probably during the time while you were working on Capitol Hill, what would happen would there would be a legal vetting process that went through the Department of Justice to ensure you weren't intervening in investigations, that they met all the qualifications, that this is a person who should be recommended for pardon. That's a good check in the system. Uh, that's not what Donald Trump did. And that's not what Donald Trump will do. What does that mean? All of these people who are helping him, who might help him attempt to overturn an election, he intends to pardon them. And he doesn't need, there is not a check in the system to prevent him from doing that, legally, technically. There should, there, there, there is a historical precedent, but there's not a check in the system. And I think that's just important for people to know and understand the, the risks of that in this moment. Jen, uh, you have an interview scheduled uh, coming up with uh, Liz Cheney. What is that? That is coming up next Monday at 8 p.m. Monday so at 8 p.m. plenty of time, Great. plenty of time to read the book. Very much looking forward to talking with her um, and diving into all of these pieces and all these questions. Can I mention one more thing, which Please. I'm sure stuck out to you, given your time on the Hill, Lawrence? You know, Mike Johnson is someone 
I've been talking about, I know you've been talking about. She raised him. What's important about that is that in order for Trump to do what he wants to do, he needs enablers. Mike Johnson is second in line to the presidency. He was an advocate. He was a partner. He was a friend for uh, what Donald Trump did on January 6th. That is a scary circumstance if Mike Johnson and Donald Trump are partners in this effort. And I, I thought it was very interesting she raised that because mm -hmm. it is alarming. That's how the structure of power, of course, works. I have a feeling uh, on Monday night at 8, we're going to be hearing more about Liz Cheney's views of Mike Johnson and so much more. Jen, thank you. I have a feeling. Great. Thank you so much, Thank you Lawrence. very much, Jen. Really appreciate it. Thank you. David, you're one of the few uh, reporters out there who actually follows what the vice president does and says and uh, how she works uh, in situations like this around the world. Uh, what was your reading of how she handled this weekend? I thought she handled it very well. It's a very tough task. It's a tough task to go into the region, uh, to speak the truth about Hamas, uh, to speak the truth about the casualties amongst the Palestinians, uh, to do it to... Uh, each of the leaders that matters to us in the region. Um, but it's also tough to do what she did, to look ahead, to talk about the day after. Since this conflict began, I'm told that within the White House, she has been a champion for focusing on the day after, for being as strategic in our approach to this uh, as we are uh, attentive to tactical details. Uh, and that's what she was talking to these regional leaders about. She was able to have the conversations that the president had intended to have when he went to Israel, but he was unable to have, if you recall, because of the uh, bombing at the Baptist Hospital in Gaza. The uh, the principles, the first two things she mentioned that she was uh, trying to get uh, these Middle Eastern governments to support reconstruction and security. Reconstruction means those countries need to contribute significant financial resources to the reconstruction of Gaza. I think that's the hope of the White House. Uh, and I think the feedback that they got is that it'll be possible once you get other preconditions met. I think one of those preconditions, frankly, is going to be the departure of Bibi Netanyahu as prime minister, which is something that many Israelis expect to have happen. I think another of those preconditions is the revitalization of the leadership of the Palestinian Authority, because I believe it's the U.S. expectation that the Palestinian Authority steps in, fills the political void left by Hamas in both Gaza and the West Bank, and that they represent the best negotiating hope to get towards a two-state solution, which once again is the goal of the United States. The uh, vice president there on the five principles she mentioned, one of them stands out, uh, no reduction in territory for Gaza. And that is something that has been discussed uh, by some uh, Israeli officials. Yes. Well, you know, within uh, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu's coalition, the small group around him, there have been a lot of rather pernicious ideas discussed. Uh, one is reduction in territory. Another one is the relocation of the residents of Gaza out of Gaza or the thinning out of Gaza. Another is Israeli reoccupation and control. And in her five principles, uh, the vice president was extremely clear the U.S. opposes all of those things. Yeah, and, and that was uh, uh, matched with uh, the very strong statement of support for Israel that is included in the same statement. It's one of, it's one of those speeches that, that examines every facet of what the administration has to deal with every day on this. It's one of the toughest diplomatic balancing acts I've ever seen. Uh, clearly, Israel has a right to self-defense. Clearly, what Hamas did was commit atrocities. It's indefensible, and they no longer can play a role in the region. But the United States also plays the role of the spokesperson, if you will, for part of the international community, urging Israel to use restraint. One of the messages delivered by the vice president was that the lessons of the war in the north of Gaza have to be applied now as Israel moves into the south of Gaza. And what that means is fewer civilian casualties.